All right, so today we're in a different spot and uh, I'm going to go through the running gear. So firstly, the ball bar, ARB something or other, I'm not entirely sure. Steel ball bar was on it when we got it. Toyota dealer gave it a respray. Front lights, they're actually some ADR approved uh, trailer rear lights. The stock globe fitting in there, the plastic just disintegrated, like completely fell apart. Went to change a blown bulb in it and the whole thing just fell apart. They have an orange section for the indicator and a white section for the reversing lights, which is just the reversing lights being the white section, they're just wired up as driving lights. And turns out those actually fit these perfectly. Looks stock. So then over here, Safari R-Max Snorkel. So this one's a bit bigger and fatter than the standard snorkel. It does mean it's copped a few more branches, but it's, um, it's tough, it can handle that. Um, but the important thing about it is it's actually significantly less restrictive than the standard snorkel. Um, so it will actually add 10 kilowatts, funnily enough. It is um, pulling in cold, clean air from up here rather than uh, the stock intake location, which is down in the wheel well, which is perfectly designed for picking up water. So this is a proper snorkel, not a raised air intake, so essential for doing water crossings. The head is removable, so you can replace this head with a cyclonic pre-filter for if you're driving in really dusty conditions, you can save all of the bigger bits of dust from even ending up in the air filter under the bonnet. So on the back, we've got the rear bar. It is an Outback Accessories uh, rear bar. It has been optioned out with dual spare tire carriers. Very simple, very agricultural over center catches here. Some of the others are significantly fancier than that, but they don't look so fancy when they get filled with red dirt and won't close. Uh, you can actually swap out one of the sides for a dual jerry can carrier instead. Having two spare tires is pretty important for remote area touring for two reasons. The first is that if you do end up with a flat tire, it's entirely possible that due to the distances involved, you may well end up with a second flat tire before you've got the first flat tire fixed. The second reason is that sometimes you end up with two flat tires because instead of it being an errant nail or a screw or a, a bit of twisted metal on the road in the city, often it's a sharp rock and you run over it with two wheels. The stock spare tire location is actually under the back here, but we have shifted the spare tires up to the back because when you're going up a steep hill, that spare tire will restrict your departure angle and it's probably not a good idea to drag the tire along the ground. In addition to that, the rear bar has sliders on the back, which also have a loop in them to be used as a recovery point, and that is quite dirty. So we don't actually have front and rear lockers. We haven't done that. So the 200 series is a little fancier electronics wise and has full off-road traction control on all four wheels. If it detects that one of the wheels is spinning, it will apply the brakes to that wheel and stop it. That has actually generally been enough. So the suspension, those springs are a bit thicker than you might be used to seeing there, and they're nice and blue. This vehicle has a 3.8 ton GVM upgrade from Lovells. And what that means is the maximum weight which the vehicle is legally allowed to carry is increased from about 3.3 tonnes stock to 3.8. Heavier suspension and it's had all of the testing and paperwork signed off on that. Loaded full of our gear, it's legal, no potential issues with insurance. And secondly, you're getting a suspension system which you know can handle that extra weight. One of the things we had when we first fitted this out, you should always do the suspension last because you don't want to find out you put in your two inch lift and then you add all of this extra weight and it pushes it back down to stock. You know with the GVM suspension that it will still be two inches lifted even with some extra weight in it. Due to the added weight of the rear bar and the tires hanging right off the back of the vehicle, we've got a plus 300 kilogram constant load springs in the rear. So these springs are even heavier than the standard ones which come with the suspension kit in order to counteract for the extra weight in the back and that stops you from, when you go over a bump, that stops the back from just pitching right down after the bump. Actually got a small modification done to this side on the rear bar. We have welded an extra bar to this 
which can mount a Kodan HF antenna behind the spare tire. Also on this wheel, we've got the Maxtrax harness. So this simply goes over the wheel and straps the Maxtrax to it and provides some rubber pads to stop them from wearing through the wheel. To stop anyone from just unhooking and running off with the Maxtrax, there is a bike lock through them. Now, one of the things I've seen that is hotly debated online, uh, when you lift the Land Cruiser 200, do you need to drop the front diff? For only a two inch lift, the answer is, well, a solid maybe. The CV joints and axles on the 200 series are significantly heavier than the ones on the 100 series. So the CVs would most likely be perfectly fine if you didn't actually uh, drop the front diff and lifted the vehicle by two inches. However, uh, we did go ahead and lower the front diff by one inch, half the lift. We want to do a lot of long range touring and it will undoubtedly lower the uh, amount of wear that it puts on the CV joints. Some people say, what's the point of lifting the vehicle then dropping things back down to wreck that ground clearance you just gained? Well, the thing is, the front diff is not the lowest thing here. There's some complaints that it makes aftermarket bash plates incompatible, only true for some of them. And as you'll see, the stock, the stock bash plate is exactly where it was. It doesn't, doesn't cause a problem with that. It's not actually dropped down by that much and it's not the lowest thing here. So the wheels, this being a fairly early model of the 200 series, this has the 17 inch wheels, which are actually quite desirable. You'll notice if you have a look on eBay, there's tons of the 18 inch wheels for sale for people saying to upgrade your older Land Cruiser to the 18 inch wheels. 17 gives you a lot wider range of off-road rubber than 18. The situation is changing and with a lot of newer four wheel drives coming with 18 inch wheels, a lot of the good off-road rubber is now available in 18s. Similar to when this vehicle was new, everyone was complaining that the 17s were too big and only the good rubber is only available in 16s. Thing is, you can't actually put 16s on the front here. They won't clear the large front brakes. So the tire size, we're running 285 by 70 R17. That's pretty much a 33, tiny bit short. I'll call it a 33. So the stock tire size is a little over a 31. Upgrading the size of the tire makes any bump you drive over smaller in relation to the tire, so it's better able to handle it. It lets you drop the tire pressure more before you're endangering the rim on the ground. And it's the only way of actually increasing your, your true ground clearance. You can lift the suspension all you like, but since the rear is a live axle, the diff will be exactly where it is between the two wheels, no matter how much you lift the suspension. The independent front suspension will gain you a little more clearance at the front, but of course puts your CVs on a greater and greater angle the more you go. But bigger tires are the only way to actually get more ground clearance. Picking up another one of these wheels, however, to have a matching set of six is a bit of an endeavor in itself. You gotta keep one eye on eBay for a couple of months. This one I actually bought from a wrecker, even picked it up for under 200 bucks with a tire still on it. Side steps. Yes, they're the stock ones. Yes, we have bent the absolute crap out of them. Uh, all of that damage was done before we got the new suspension and we were actually sitting a little under stock height. Maybe I'll replace them with rock sliders at some point, maybe. Since we've lifted the suspension, they haven't touched the ground, so it's, it's once again a trade-off between you don't automatically go and always get these things because it's money and it's weight. But lastly, on the bonnet. So one of the things we've done is fitted a ProVent catch can. So as you may know, piston goes up, fuel-air mixture explodes, forcing piston down. The piston doesn't make a perfect seal in the cylinder. So a tiny bit of that explosion gets around the piston and ends up in the crankcase at the bottom of the engine. And of course, this pressurizes the crankcase. But the thing is, because the piston's coated in oil, so it slides up and down the cylinder, uh, this explosion pushing um, gases past the cylinder ends up being a fine mist of oil. So naturally for more than say environmental reasons. Um, also, you know, it's a nice flammable mist of oil. We can't just vent this thing out the side of the engine. That'd be bad. We can't vent it into the exhaust because it'd also just be a fire in the exhaust pipe. So what stock engines will do 
is they'll redirect that back into the air intake and just burn it in the engine. This is also how you get older, more worn out engines burning a lot of oil. So what does a catch can do? Well, what we simply do is from the hose coming out of the crankcase and the hose going back into the air intake, so crankcase, air intake, we simply just put a filter and a can in line with that. So we just catch all of the oil and put it in a can. A little bit of oil, yep. So every five to 10,000 kilometers, you simply drain the can and every uh, 50,000, you replace the filter. All of that extra oil isn't coating the inside of your intercooler, coating the inside of your turbos and just generally gunking up your air intake. Oh yeah, so last part of the running gear. I mean, we've got the, we got the V8 here. How does it get to the wheels? A big feature of the 200 series Land Cruiser is that it has what's called full-time four-wheel drive. This means that it has a center differential between the front and back axles. And when the center differential is unlocked, it's effectively all wheel drive. When the center differential is locked, it's four wheel drive. So this means that it is always capable of delivering power to all four wheels, giving it much better on-road handling. Uh, the 200 series is an automatic. It's a six speed auto and there's no real option for a manual. Although side note, um, there is a variant of the Land Cruiser 200 with a V6 petrol engine and a manual gearbox. I don't think many of them got sold in Australia, but it does exist. However, you probably do not want this in a V6 petrol. That engine is basically as thirsty, if not more than the V8s, because it is way too underpowered for dragging a car of this size around. So it is an automatic gearbox. It's a six speed auto, though you would be entirely forgiven for thinking it was a five speed auto because they really didn't do a good job with the gearbox programming and it does not use sixth gear very much. You basically only get into sixth at about 110k an hour. And only then until you uh, apply any pressure to the accelerator, then it drops back to fifth. It's not incredibly smooth. If you re-engage first going up a steep hill, it is a bit of a kick in the backside. Fundamentally, that's going to happen because it's a transmission from a light truck. On the other hand, this is a light truck, so it is well suited for the job. The equivalent year Nissan patrols, when they have an auto gearbox fitted, it was one from a car. Well, that further went on to reinforce the reputation of having automatics in four-wheel drives as being unreliable. The automatic does have some advantages over a manual, though. You can be really smooth with the power delivery. You never have to worry about stalling the engine. You can change gears while halfway up an ascent because it will smoothly change between them and you don't have the period of being in neutral with the clutch. You can start off much more smoothly. You don't have the issues of letting water into things when you put your foot on the clutch halfway through a water crossing. Join us next time for an outline of the recovery gear. Subscribe so you don't miss it and see you then.